You know, there's a funny story where my mom would say, she would tell us the first time she walked into a McDonald's and uh, she saw, a, you know, a hot dog. And she literally said, I didn't know Americans ate dog. <laughs> <laughs> and she would tell us a story. I didn't know how funny that was until I became an adult. I'm like, oh my God, mom, that's funny that you thought Americans ate dog. Cause that's what they think of us. What if I told you there were gifts in being bullied? Would you believe me? Would you think I'm nuts? I'm not nuts. And Tom Newen's about to show you how there are gifts in being bullied. At age three years old, Tom Newen left his home in Vietnam during the fall of Saigon. His mother and two sisters went by boat to Guam, then on to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They lived in Section 8 housing, the ghetto. Because of the Americans' hatred of the Vietnam War, Tan and his family were constantly ridiculed. You can sense when someone doesn't like you. you can yeah. See, you know, when they walk by you in the stairwell, they bump you. When, they, uh, when they're walking through the, the door that has to be buzzed in, they close it before you can get to okay. it. Men and women both doing this to you or primarily men? Uh, men and women. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, there were families, I remember families telling their children they were not allowed to play with us because we were Vietnamese. Oh, gosh. You know, so when you hear other adults tell their children, your peers, yeah. that you can't play with me because I'm Vietnamese, I then, as a child, have to question what's wrong with what's me. What's wrong with me? Funny thing about living in the ghetto, there, to me, there was a hierarchy. And that hierarchy determined who was going to get beat up the most. Every day I walked to school, I had to fight my way to school. How old were you? Eight. How far was the walk? It was across the, uh, it was across the complex. I just want you to kind of take us in there, what you went through. Sure, so, you know, in the morning, my mom would already be gone. My sister would make sure we had breakfast. Then, you know, uh, then we all got our books. We walked out of the apartment and we started walking over to school, and there was a path that led by uh, some tennis courts, and uh, so it, it was a good, you know, it was a good five minute walk. And so during this walk, all the other kids were walking at the same time, because we, we all went to the same elementary school. And of course, as we're making our way, the bullies, as they normally would, have their they're staked out areas. Guys. The guys. How many, how many, how many, two, three, four? Uh, yeah, I mean, no, I don't think there was any less than five, you know, running in packs of five. And so once they saw me, it was a beeline straight to me with, you know, harassment, pushing. And all five, one, or just mainly all five? It would start with one. And then once, you know, once the fighting started, Man. the others would jump in. Man. You know, so to protect myself or my sisters, you know, I would cut them off at the pass and it would turn into a fight. A it physical was, downright physical, fight. Physical downright fight. And once we were done, you know, they would get, at some point they would say this, you know, they're bored. They'll walk off to school. I'll gather my things. My sister will help me pick up my stuff and we'll walk off to school too. I wasn't, because I wasn't afraid to fight back, you know, at some point they just got tired of having to physically fight me. You did fight back. I did. Yeah, I mean, it, it didn't hurt any less emotionally and mentally. It's just I had no other choice. You also have to put yourself in a position where you think, if it isn't just fighting back physically, what else do I have to do to get these guys to accept me? Because if they accept me, they'll stop mm -hmm. fighting me or they'll stop bullying me. And that's, you know, that's where humor comes in. Imagine if, if you're on the ground and, uh, and they're, they're, you know, bullying you on the ground and you're like, oh my God, you're so heavy. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're like, what? It's like, yeah, what'd you eat, man? They're heavy. <laughs> or if there are the other four, you know, minions behind them yeah. and you're like, oh, can I just choose one of you guys to fight and not all of you today? It isn't using humor to be part of his bullying. It's using humor to get him to stop. Before you went to school, or on the way home, did you start thinking in your brain, what if I say this, I could say this to him? No, absolutely, you, you, you have to planning. plan and prepare for it. And you know, and that's a skill set I, uh, I have, a discipline that I have now in the workplace. Yes, yes. It's planning, yes. I mean, it's thinking ahead, because yes. you have to really think, what is that person gonna say to me in this boardroom? 
uh, you know, or in this meeting. Sometimes what you see other people do that don't use humor, you know, they, they, they give them money or they give them, you know, whatever they have just to get them yeah. to go I believe, away. I believe that's called extortion. Yeah, it is. <laughs> And, and of course, I didn't have any money, and sure. I didn't have anything, so I was like, down to the humor part. Why didn't you ever tell your mom? You're being bullied. Why didn't you tell your mom? No one could have ever had a life as hard as my mom, displaced from your home country. Come and face racism, sexism, language barriers, um, a trade, you know, where, where your trade or whatever your education was doesn't apply. Uh, three kids in tow. She started her day early, before the sun came up, and she didn't end her day until well after midnight. How many jobs and what did she do? It could be four to five different jobs. Um, cleaning buses, cleaning offices, washing dishes, sewing, just any type of labor that she could do. And why was she doing this? Because as a refugee, her, her trades or skill sets didn't transfer with her. Her education didn't transfer with her. So she had to find work to make ends meet until she could find better work. She was going to, uh, or she was going to night school to try and get an equivalent, you know, degree so that she could actually get a real On top of all this, she's job. going to night school. Right. But when you see your mom coming home and she just looks like she's been drained of her of her energy of her spirit and you know that she's leaving within four more hours to do it again and that she's just trying to keep it together if you hear her crying at night if, did, did uh, you yeah i mean if you hear your mom crying it's, it's one of the worst things that you could ever hear so you decide you know i'm not going to be that burden on my mom because she doesn't need it right now and my sisters, you know, we decide to take care of each other. That, that's, that's how that works out. You know, you, you, you start leaning on your siblings because collectively you know, don't stress out mom. Mom has it hard enough. So you start, you start getting bullied and, and start fighting seven years old, eight mm -hmm. years old? Yep. So now we're six years later, maybe. Still. Still fighting, still going through all this, but you, you're living this life. Now you decide to take a knife? To school for a fight. Because it was the challenge. The challenge was, if I'm, I recall the kid saying, I'm going to kill you. My teacher found out that I had a knife in my jacket. And so she dismissed the class, asked me to stay. My mom was there and the principal, my teacher, and some other administrators were there. And he says, your, your son brought a weapon to school. We don't want him in our school anymore. Even though I explained, mom, this kid threatened to kill me. So the, you know, the principal and of course these administrators gave my mom an option. Milton Hershey is the chocolate magnet. Hershey corporations, Hershey chocolates. Gotcha. So Milton and his wife, Catherine, couldn't have children of their own. So they started a school called the Hershey Industrial School. We lived in homes with a total of 18 kids. So a boy's, a, a boy's student home would have up to 18 boys and a set of house parents. There was a discipline uh, in, uh, scheduled into your life. Mm -hmm. The kids that you live with and grow up with are kids coming from the same conditions. And you know you work side by side uh, together. You live side by side together. There, become you know you develop a great, uh, I, I guess, sibling relationship. And and what we learned is, in in an environment where everyone is treated equally, and given the same means, we looked at each other without prejudice. Was there bullying going on in there? We didn't feel that way anymore. So the environment that Milton Hershey School created absolutely removed that from my life gotcha and then i could thrive academically athletically because i didn't have the distractions of wondering who's going to come after me tomorrow did you go to college yep where'd you go james madison university what'd you major in psychology and i loved it i spent my first um couple years after graduation working for a institution called rica regional institute for children and adolescents in sheltonham maryland and those kids, 9 to 18, came from the court systems, severely, emotionally, uh, mentally, 
physically abused kids who had a very severe uh, psychological conditions that lived in the facility itself. So it was, it was my cycle. Sure. It was my giving back. It was my attempt to start helping the same kids that were in trouble. And I think it would be irresponsible of me, given all my experiences and the example set to me by Milton and Catherine Hershey, that if I used my success only for my own personal gain without giving back, I think that would just, I think that would go against everything that not only my mom has taught me, but what example the Hershey family has taught me. Tom took everything he learned about getting bullied and applied it to his business life, which he's been very successful. His company was very innovative to get videos on our cell phones. We did build a platform that would ingest content, video content, encode it, transcode it to fit the different families of phone devices so that it can deliver any type of content you put into the machine and it automatically diced and sliced it up so that it would work on every type of phone. We actually uh, worked with uh, Sprint and we um, launched nine channels on Sprint TV and those channels we had, or I went out and secured mobile distribution rights to companies like Turner Broadcasting, uh, I got Cartoon Network, um, Sony Pictures and Television, the National Geographic channel, all the Discovery uh, channels. So they can watch this on their phone now. They can watch it on their phone. And not to get too personal now, because of her investments, she's very wise and smart, and those investments have led to very successful other investments. Right. Let's, is that a nice way to put it? Yes. She's, she's very successful financially. Yes. She had five jobs, six jobs. She's working how many hours a day? 12, 12 15 yeah. a day, coming home crying, suffering, yeah. doing all this stuff. She worked hard yep. and figured out a way to make it work just like you did. Right. So, but I'm guessing you had to go through those struggles to get to that. Yeah, you do. But, and, but during those struggles, you have to choose. You have choices you have to make. Do you let your surroundings control you? Or do you control your surroundings? Accept the fact that life's not fair. Realize that there are obstacles. Understand that you are empowered to make decisions that you don't have to follow. I was told this story by my mom that uh, as, a, as a child, you can imagine, you know, you're on this boat and there's water. And like any child, I would want to yeah. touch the water. Well, apparently I tried that and I fell over. So I'm overboard. And my, my mom's story goes, as I fall overboard, she's screaming and the boat's still going. So she's screaming down the boat and, and they made a chain and people jumped in to grab me and they pulled me back into the boat. I could have died, which means I'm on a second life, which means I can't waste this life. The feeling of being bullied, the feeling of having a group of kids uh, tear you down, you know, mentally, emotionally, um, the physical, you know, attack on you, those leave a very deep impression. So many variables. First, you could think, you know what, my, my parent at home talks so bad about this particular ethnicity, when I see someone of that ethnicity, I'm going to, you know, be the extension of my parent and make sure that they know that I don't like them. Too. But they do it as a group. They do it individual. Is there is there a group thing to it? Well, it depends. You, you can have a group thing because people are so, they want to follow, right? That's just a personality trait among, it's easier for you to participate in negative behavior as a group because it's excusable. I didn't do it. We did it. So if you get caught or your parent goes, why would you do that? You're not that type of person. Um, I was with them. But the kid just wants to be accepted by that. Absolutely. Group. Okay. And, and that's, so the dynam that's the dynamic of a gang. So that's acceptance. Yeah. The real popular kids in high school that are mean to other kids. Now, you might find that other, uh, some, ch some kid might see just how mean they are to someone. And they're like, before they can bully me... I'm going to just become one of their minions. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, that's yeah. social learning. When I hear about kids who are bullied, I start thinking about how, how can you help someone understand that as, as horrible, as horrible and even debilitating as that experience is, there are lessons there. Lessons that no one else will learn as quickly as you. The individual who does participate in hate, they actually just come up to your face and tell you, I don't like your kind. I should have shot you when you were a baby when I was in Vietnam. And I can tell by your eyes people have said that to you. Absolutely. No kidding. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I have had fathers of girls that I've dated tell me, I don't like the fact that you're dating my white daughter so that you can get a step up in the social ladder. Her mom chimes in as well. Yes, do you realize how people will look at you while you're dating my daughter? What do you do when he says that to you? It's like being back in the ghetto. You gotta figure, you know, you decide, and immediately I decide, I have to win this person over. I have to correct their interpretation of, of mixed race couples. I have to try and help them believe that their view of the world may not be as accurate. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. Sure. I'm saying it may not be as horrible as you think it will be. You have to make the choice to stop the cycle. So we would have the conversation. I would say, I would ask, why do you feel that way? Directly. Directly. Because at, at that point, you don't have to be polite anymore. They've taken polite <laughs> off the table, right? Yeah. Why do you feel that way? Did they ever ask you to leave? They did not, which was nice. Because our conversation actually went down the road of trying to find out, why do you think I'm so bad? And it and it's, comes from misinformation. It comes from uh, their own fears of how people will look at them. Not that's, just their daughter. That's it. But them. 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 It's more then, about them than their daughter. Isn't absolutely. It? Will they always hear you or even care what you have to say? Probably not. But you can choose to address it. Now, now remember earlier I, I said people who hate, they want you to justify why they hate you. So they're hoping to evoke a particular response from you, one that's also hate. So by you getting physical or you lashing back out, and being just as hateful or racist, they can say, see, I told you. That guy is just as terrible as I thought he was. Are you also saying they're using hate because they want to justify their own hate? Yeah, absolutely. Is, is that a possibility too, you think? No, it, it, it's, it's, an, it's a fact. It's not just a possibility. It's, it justifies why I behave with hate if you act that way. Where'd you learn that? I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think at some point, for me, it just became a matter of, I can't be like them. And so if you start there by realizing you don't want to be the very same bitter and angry and hateful person, then you start realizing that you can make your own changes and your own decisions, and that you can be better than that, and then you can go out and help others understand that they don't have to fall into the same trap. I want you to look in this camera over here, all right? And I want you to look at a kid and talk to a kid and, and that's being bullied, that's being made fun of by a group of kids, what they should do. If you're being bullied, you have to, you have to realize several things, first and foremost. That bullying is not dictating who you are or your own value. Only you can do that. You have to believe that you are better than the bully and that you are more than what the bullies suggest you are and that you are empowered to always make choices for yourself and rise above the bullying.